Catherine, the Princess of Wales, announced Friday that she has been diagnosed with cancer. And almost immediately after her announcement, parts of the UK media began declaring that the public should feel ashamed, that the speculation around Kate was unacceptable and cruel. And perhaps you're starting to question if maybe they are right. But what these media outlets and Kensington Palace aren't saying is that blaming you, blaming the public, was always part of the plan. The abuse and dehumanization of women marrying into the British royal family by parts of the UK media and the institution itself is well documented, but so is their pattern of blame, and this has been happening for almost three decades. When Diana married Charles, she had what the firm wanted, beauty, magnetism, star power. She brought renewed glamour to the British monarchy, but she also had what they didn't want, intelligence and a voice of her own. So especially when Charles and Diana divorced, she was fair game for tabloid abuse. Diana was labeled unstable, her appearance constantly scrutinized, and of course, she was pitted against another royal woman. And this abuse served two purposes. It made the tabloids a lot of money, and it protected the monarchy. Charles's affair with Camilla had greatly damaged his reputation, and damaging his reputation damaged the monarchy. So the firm and the media needed a villain, and they made one. One that made them a huge amount of money. The press's obsession over Diana was a lucrative one, with these photos of her and Dodi Fayed reportedly being sold to the UK tabloids for £1.7 million. Paparazzi did anything they could to get photos of her, knowing that the UK media would be quick to buy them. That is, until she died. And then suddenly, those tabloids and royal reporters who just days prior were labeling her sex mad and saying she needed to keep quiet like Camilla were lamenting about Britain's poor lost princess. But did those UK tabloids own up to their part in the press and public's obsession with Diana? Did they recognize how they had encouraged those photographers to chase her into that tunnel? No, they blamed someone else. In the days that followed Diana's death, the UK media cautioned the public to not be too hasty with their blame. And knowing they needed to change the narrative, collectively, they pushed the blame onto French photographers. This wasn't the UK media's doing, they insisted. Foreign photographers were to blame. But they leave out that those foreign photographers were planning to sell those photos right back to the UK tabloids. We'll do better, the UK media insisted. It's up to us now to protect the people's princes. But as we know, that promise was quickly forgotten, especially when it came to Harry and his wife. When Harry and Meghan were chased through New York for more than two hours by paparazzi, it was only the UK tabloids who purchased and published the photos the next day. Yet when they were called out on it by the Sussexes, like they always do, they passed the blame. The tabloids and royal reporters insisted that the car chase would not have happened in Britain. The paparazzi was a U.S. problem, and they even went as far as to question Harry and Meghan's mental health and if the event happened at all. These outlets write hateful, clickbait stories every day about the Sussexes, but again refuse to take any accountability for the harm that they inflict. They collect the money, but pass the blame. And the media's handling of Kate's situation is no different. If we look at the Google Trends, when Kate's surgery was first announced and for weeks after, the public interest was low. She was largely given the privacy that the media keeps shouting about. It wasn't until Kensington Palace and presumably William and Kate decided to distribute a manipulated photo to global media outlets, one that was so far from reality that major news organizations not only issued a kill notice, but compared Kensington Palace's credibility to North Korea. That woke the public up. And the firm's response of pinning the blame on Kate only made matters worse. The response that happened on social media and in print media was created by the firm, a firm that is used to mainly positive media coverage, written for an aging royalist audience that lacks media literacy skills and doesn't question the royal family. Both the firm and the UK media saw the global response, and they could have ended it then, but they chose not to. Instead, they fanned the flames of speculation, publishing articles about Rose Hanbury, criticizing the manipulated photo themselves, 
and when they were not given their usual access to information, demanded that the whales tell the truth of what is really going on. They discussed every photo, every statement, and every part of the story on their front pages and on their daily talk shows. And of course, they made their money. The Sun and the Daily Mail were reportedly in a bidding war over the video of William and Kate from the farmer's market, with the Sun winning and paying a reported £200,000 for the footage. And according to the Sun's editor, Victoria Newton, Kensington Palace was in on the deal. Um, in terms of reporting the fact that they went out to the Windsor farm shop uh, a few days later, they knew that if they went out there in, in public, mingled with members of the public, they would be seen and potentially photographed because everyone's got a camera phone now and that's how it happened. It wasn't a photographer, it was a camera phone. And of course I was in discussions with the palace all along with that and there was no problem with us running, r running those images and it kind of felt that the nation was desperate to see her. The UK tabloids and Kensington Palace had no problem fueling speculation when it benefited them and made them money. But now that Kate's cancer has been revealed, the narrative has to shift, and they are pointing the finger at the public. The public, who was reading the articles they wrote and watching their discussions on television, and then began to question what was really going on, a public that was questioning too much. Because if the public is realizing that Kensington Palace and certain UK media outlets lack credibility in this instance, then they might also see that they lack credibility in other areas. They might see that the pomp and pageantry of the royal family is really just a facade for these two institutions to retain power and wealth. And the pageantry that they rely on comes at the dehumanization of the members of that family, particularly the women, and particularly Diana, Meghan, and Kate. And yes, Kate has been protected in a way that Meghan and Diana never were. The coverage of her has been mainly positive in recent years. But positive or negative, the messaging from the palace is the same, and that it says these women are ours to control, critique, and when it is beneficial to the monarchy, crucify. But when the public paying attention and caring turns into criticism of the firm, then they want the conversations to stop. The public blame, the shaming, that is a PR move, and one that they hope will work, because they don't necessarily want people to stop talking about Kate, but they do want people to stop questioning the monarchy. And when the public said, no, no, this is not on us, the blame shifted once again. But I would encourage you to keep asking questions. Keep asking who benefits from a shamed, silent public. Keep asking how the monarchy and the media benefit from the public blaming each other instead of questioning them. And keep asking what else they don't want the public to know.